to Steel Incorporated's Chainsaw Safety, Maintenance, and Operation. This program has been developed to give chainsaw operators the basic information needed to properly and safely use a chainsaw. Although this program will cover a wide variety of subjects, Steel always recommends that before you operate your chainsaw, read and fully understand your owner's manual. This manual will cover the important items that will be specific to your chainsaw's design, features, and operation. An important key to using your chainsaw safely and properly is understanding its design and features. Although not all chainsaws will be the same, many are common to most new saws manufactured today. Refer to your manufacturer's owner's manual for more detailed information on the features available on your chainsaw. Shown here is the chainsaw's anti-vibration system, commonly referred to as the AV system. Made up of a series of vibration isolating buffers, the AV system is designed to reduce the transmission of vibrations created by the engine and the cutting attachment to your hands, increasing control, comfort, and decreasing fatigue. The AV system should be part of your periodic inspection and maintenance process, which will be covered later in this program. If the AV system is ever in question or has failed, repair it immediately or take your chainsaw to your authorized dealer for the necessary repairs prior to using your chainsaw again. These are the chainsaw's front and rear hand guards. The rear guard is designed to protect your right hand as well as a key feature used in one method of properly starting your chainsaw. The front hand guard is designed to protect against projecting branches and reduces the risk of the left hand coming into contact with the chain if your hand were to slip off the handlebar. The front hand guard on steel chainsaws also functions as part of the chain brake device that stops the rotation of the chain if activated. And an additional chain brake activation device that can be found on many saws today is an inertia chain brake available on steel chainsaws also capable of stopping the rotation of the chain in certain situations if the kickback force is high enough, even if your hand doesn't contact the front hand guard. A third braking device available on select steel chainsaws called the QS chain braking system is located at the rear handle. When the operator completely releases the rear handle and the interlock lever with their right hand, the braking device is activated and stops the rotation of the chain. Kickbacks will be covered in more detail in the chainsaw operation portion of this program. Another very important safety feature is the throttle trigger interlock. This feature helps in preventing the chainsaw from accidentally accelerating when moving around in the work area. When you have a firm grip on the rear handle, the throttle trigger interlock is depressed. You can now activate the throttle trigger and accelerate the saw. When you release the rear handle, the throttle trigger interlock isn't depressed and the saw's throttle trigger will not activate, accelerating the saw unexpectedly, a situation that otherwise could cause serious injury. Your saw will have controls for the starting and stopping functions of the engine. Steel uses their trademarked master control lever shown here. One lever performs all of the functions necessary from full choke, fast idle for warm start, followed by the run position, and stop, which turns the engine off. Check your chainsaw's owner's manual if you have a system different from this for the proper operating functions of your controls. Some chainsaws come with a decompression valve, typically on chainsaws with higher displacement engines. Depressing this valve releases compression in the cylinder, resulting in easier pulling action when starting. Once the engine begins to run, the decompression valve will automatically return to the closed position, allowing the engine to regain full compression. A feature to be aware of on your chainsaw, particularly in the maintenance process, is access to the air filter. Here, steel utilizes a toolless air filter cover that can let you easily access the filter for quick inspection, cleaning, or replacement. Some chainsaws come with a winter-summer shutter, a device that can be adjusted to the winter position, allowing the saw to draw heat from around the cylinder into the air box where the carburetor is located. This is useful when using your chainsaw in damp and cold climates, where icing of the carburetor can occur. Then, when working in warmer conditions, the shutter can be reversed to the summer position, blocking the warm air from entering the air box and overheating the carburetor. Some carburetors can be adjusted to compensate for conditions such as altitude or climate, yet others may be preset and non-adjustable. 
Check your owner's manual for the proper carburetor adjustment procedures for your saw. Your chainsaw has two fluid reservoirs. One will hold gasoline and two-cycle oil mix that will fuel and lubricate the engine. And the other reservoir is for bar and chain oil needed to lubricate the bar and chain. A mistake sometimes made by novice chainsaw users is to put raw, unmixed gasoline into the fuel reservoir and oil in the bar and chain oil reservoir, thinking that the two will mix automatically to create the gasoline oil mix needed to run and lubricate the engine. Be very careful not to make this mistake, as it will result in serious and costly damage to your chainsaw. Never run a chainsaw with raw, unmixed gasoline. Always pre-mix your gasoline with the proper two-cycle engine oil in a separate container for your chainsaw's needs. And use specially formulated bar and chain oil for your bar and chain reservoir. Check your owner's manual for the recommended gasoline and two-cycle oil mixture ratio. Steel recommends a 50 to 1 ratio when using steel branded oil and gasoline that has a minimum octane rating of 89. Another small but helpful feature on this steel chainsaw are the cap retainers preventing the fuel and chain oil reservoir caps from possibly being dropped in the dirt, or worse yet, becoming lost. These lines cast into the chainsaw are called felling sights, sometimes referred to as gunning sights, a feature often used by today's professionals in modern felling techniques. They aid in helping the chainsaw operator fall a tree in a desired location more precisely. Your chainsaw will come with a muffler equipped with a spark arrester, the muffler and spark arrestor must be inspected periodically and maintained, which we will cover in the maintenance segment of the program. On the clutch side of the chainsaw, you will find the chain adjustment mechanism. Although there are several different designs of adjusters depending on the manufacturer, the procedure used to adjust the chain will basically be the same for everyone. When you remove the chain and sprocket cover, you will see a device called a chain catcher. This is another important protective device designed to reduce the risk of personal injury in the event of a thrown or broken chain. Here you see the bar and chain oil feed rate adjustment available on many of the newer saws made today. Different feed rates of bar and chain oil may be required for different bar lengths or types of wood being cut. By turning this adjustment clockwise or counterclockwise, you will vary the oil feed rate as required for your working conditions. With the steel system, the E setting is the most economical. Turning the adjustment clockwise increases the oil feed rate and turning it counterclockwise decreases the oil feed rate. The spiked bumper on the front of the saw is designed to hold the saw steady against the wood when cutting, particularly when bucking. Regardless of whether it's before you use your chainsaw, while you're working with your chainsaw, or after you've finished your work, inspection and maintenance are critical to not only the chainsaw's mechanical integrity, but also your chainsaw's ability to function properly and safely. Most owner's manuals will have a section with a maintenance chart detailing the types of maintenance you should perform and at what intervals. In your steel manual, this section will cover the basic inspection and maintenance that you must perform to keep your steel chainsaw in top shape. If you are unable to perform any of these functions for any reason, return your chainsaw to an authorized dealer to have the inspection and maintenance performed before you use your chainsaw. Performing an inspection and performing proper maintenance of your chainsaw and its components prior to using your saw will result in a more productive and safer cutting experience. Always make sure that you have turned off the engine, the chain is stopped, and the muffler is cool before refueling, making adjustments, performing maintenance or repairs, changing the saw chain, or cleaning the saw. And never attempt any maintenance or repair work not described in your owner's manual. Have those items taken care of by your authorized dealer. First, check the fasteners on your chainsaw, making sure they are snug. Retighten any loose fasteners and replace any that may be missing or damaged. Check the AV system and that all of the buffers are in place and functioning properly. Replace damaged, broken or excessively worn buffers immediately. They may result in loss of control of your chainsaw. A sponginess in the feel of the saw, increased vibration or noticeable bottoming during normal operation may indicate damage, breakage or excessive wear. And, if replacement is necessary, always replace the buffers in sets. Check your air filter often. 
There are several different types and designs of air filters, and if yours is dirty, clean the filter according to the manufacturer's directions in the owner's manual, or replace the filter if necessary. Most filters can be cleaned temporarily by simply tapping them on a log, for instance, releasing the heavier particles that have built up on the filter. A tip when accessing your air filter, always close the choke on your carburetor before removing the air filter. This will block sawdust or dirt from accidentally falling into the throat of the carburetor. Occasionally, you will need to inspect your fuel filter. Be cautious not to do this around any open flames or other sources of ignition, as fumes from the tank are very flammable. Clean or replace the fuel filter as necessary, according to your owner's manual. Make sure that the chain on your saw does not rotate on the bar when the saw is at idle. If the chain moves when the saw is idling, you must adjust the saw's idle using the proper adjustment screw on the carburetor. Check your owner's manual for more detailed information on your saw's idle screw placement and adjustment procedure. If you cannot get the chain to stop rotating at idle, take the saw to your authorized dealer for the necessary adjustments or repairs before using your saw. Check your muffler and spark arrestor according to your manual's maintenance schedule. If you find that the spark arrestor is clogged or dirty, clean the part or replace it. Operating your saw with a clogged spark arrestor can cause serious damage to your saw's engine. And never operate your chainsaw without the spark arrestor, as the sparks from the muffler can easily start a fire. The bar, chain, and sprocket will require frequent inspection and upkeep, and are some of the highest maintenance components of your chainsaw. There are two types of sprockets commonly used on chainsaws today, rim-type sprockets and spur sprockets. Sprockets will wear as the saw is used and will require replacement. A good rule of thumb for replacement is to install a new sprocket after every two chains that you wear out. Here is a new unworn rim sprocket, and this is a rim sprocket with considerable wear that should be replaced. This is a spur-type sprocket with no wear and one that is worn and should be replaced as well. The method for replacing your sprocket will depend on the mounting design used on your chainsaw. On most steel models, steel uses an outboard mount design that is very easy to service, even in the field. Simply remove the E-clip and the washer and the rim slips off the clutch drum, and the drum and bearing will now slide off the crankshaft. Now you can easily clean your parts and reinstall them making sure to add a slight amount of high temperature grease to the needle bearing and crankshaft. When reinstalling the drum on your steel saw, rotate it about one turn to make sure that you've engaged the oil pump drive. Slip on the rim and reinstall the washer and E-clip. Other styles may require the removal of the clutch first with special tools to access the sprocket for maintenance. Check your owner's manual for the procedure to properly replace your sprocket. Your saw chain will require sharpening. The frequency for sharpening your chain will depend on several factors, such as whether or not you have let the chain come into contact with the ground or any other foreign object, the type of wood you are cutting, the amount of dirt or foreign objects that can be embedded in the wood. Here, for example, is where a barbed wire fence has been absorbed by a tree through years of growth, and your chain can reach speeds up to 45 miles per hour, and if it comes into contact with the ground for just a split second, that can be more than enough to dull the chain to the point that it will require immediate sharpening. Even a standing tree will have a certain amount of dirt embedded into its bark from windblown debris that will dull your chain over time. One good rule of thumb to make sure your chain remains sharp and in good condition is to file the chain with a few light strokes on each tooth using a file and guide each time you refuel, even if you think it's still sharp. You can determine the chain's condition by physically inspecting the cutter edges for rough or worn spots. Also, be sure to inspect the chain links and rivets for wear, cracks, or damage. If any part of your chain is cracked, worn, or damaged, you should replace it immediately and have the damaged chain inspected and repaired if possible by your authorized dealer. When operating your chainsaw, there are certain things you can look for that will indicate the condition of your chain. When the chain is sharpened properly, it will produce large, well-defined chips from the cut, as seen here. When a chain isn't sharpened properly or is dull, it will produce a finely granulated form of powdery sawdust like this. Looking at the sawdust is a good first indication of the condition of your chain. 
In operation, your chainsaw is designed to cut effortlessly and with very little pressure applied by the operator. If you find that you have to apply excess pressure to the saw in order for it to cut, the chain is most likely dull. Or you may have a problem with your bar and chain lubrication system. Often when you find that you have to apply a lot of pressure to make the chainsaw cut, you will also see smoke coming off the tip of the bar, another good indication of the chain's condition or a lubrication problem. If these conditions occur, you may need to sharpen the chain immediately or replace it and check the bar and chain lubrication system. To continue cutting with a dull chain or a lack of bar and chain lubricant will cause operator fatigue and a high rate of wear on critical parts of your chainsaw. Another indicator to look for is if your chainsaw tends to drift right or left in the cut. This would indicate that the angles on your chain have been sharpened incorrectly and will need to be resharpened or it could mean that your bar rails have worn unevenly. This can also cause operator fatigue, unsafe operating conditions, or damage to your chainsaw. With the right tools and instruction, you can maintain your steel bar, chain, and sprocket with confidence. Let's look at how you would perform this service in the field. When you're ready to service the bar and chain, pick a large flat area to perform the work, such as the tailgate of a pickup truck, Remember, the chain has sharp edges, so always be sure to wear sturdy work gloves when handling the bar and chain. With the chainsaw engine turned off and the muffler cooled down and the chain brake released, use your bar wrench to loosen and remove the nuts on the chain sprocket cover. Remove the cover, release the bar from the chain tensioner's adjustment pin, slide the bar back and remove the chain and the bar. Check your sprocket and drum for wear and make sure they rotate freely. If the sprocket is significantly worn, you should replace it. At this point, it's a good idea to clean away the sawdust and debris that is built up on the saw with a rag. Even an old toothbrush can come in handy for this task. Clean the inside portion of the cover around the clutch drum area, taking special care to clean thoroughly around the automatic chain oiler's discharge area, not allowing anything to become lodged in the portal. Your bar will also need to be checked and maintained. If your bar has a roller or sprocket nose, make sure that the roller or sprocket nose rotates freely. Some bars may have a grease hole at the tip that will require greasing periodically. Check your owner's manual for the maintenance procedure for your chainsaw's guide bar. With a rag, wipe the bar down removing any debris. With a bar groove cleaning tool like the one shown here, starting from the tip of the bar, Remove the debris that's become impacted in the bar rails. And remember to always wear gloves when handling your bar, as the bar rails can become very sharp as they become worn. The rearward end of the bar will have a series of holes and slots. These are the oil inlet hole, the chain tensioner's adjustment pin hole, and the bar stud slot. It is extremely important that these areas are completely free from dirt and impacted debris. Through wear, you may find that your bar rails will form a rolled over edge. If this occurs, with a flat file, smooth the edges down, again making sure to wear gloves during the process. If the bar is severely worn, you will need to replace it. Now that your components are cleaned, reinstall the guide bar on the saw. First, turn the chain tensioner's adjustment screw counterclockwise, allowing the pin to move back towards the sprocket. This will allow slack in the chain, making it easier to install. When installing your guide bar, always place the bar with the opposite side up from when you last took it off. Doing so, you will displace the wear more evenly on both sides of the bar, resulting in a longer service life. Place your bar over the bar studs, sliding it as far back as you can. Install the chain on the bar, making certain the cutting edge of the chain will rotate in a clockwise direction around the bar when looking at it from the sprocket side. Once the chain is placed on the bar and the drivers are properly engaged with the sprocket, position the bar where the chain tensioner adjustment pin lines up with the proper hole in the guide bar. Reinstall the chain sprocket cover and the nuts, but only finger tight as you will need movement in the guide bar to adjust the chain. The bar will have slight up and down play to adjust your chain properly, turn the adjusting screw tensioning the chain to the point where it sits firmly against the bottom rail of the bar, but not so tight that the chain won't rotate freely around the bar. Continue to hold the tip of the bar up and tighten the nuts on the cover. 
Double check your work by pulling down on the chain and letting it snap back, and by rotating the chain around the bar. If the chain doesn't snap back snugly against the bottom rail, you will need to tighten it some more. And if it won't rotate freely around the guide bar by hand, you have over-tightened the chain and will need to loosen it slightly. Repeat the adjustment process until the proper chain tension has been achieved. As the chain gets hot, it will stretch, as well as by wear through use. Constantly keep an eye on your chain's adjustment when working with the saw. If you see that it's loose, turn the saw off, let the muffler cool down, disengage the chain brake, and make the necessary adjustments. And remember, even a dull chain can be sharp enough to cut you, so always wear gloves when handling the chain or making adjustments. A loose chain can cause serious damage to your saw. And if loose enough, it can even come off the bar, possibly causing serious injury to the operator. If your chain appears to be sticking to the bar or will not rotate smoothly when you accelerate the saw, turn off the saw and check to see if you have bar and chain oil in the bar and chain oil reservoir. You can check to see if your oiler is working by holding the tip of the guide bar near a fresh cut piece of wood, taking extreme precaution not to let the tip of the bar touch the wood and accelerating the saw with the chain brake disengaged. If the oiler is working, you will see a fine film of oil that will appear on the wood. If you have sufficient bar and chain oil, and your oiler is working properly, but the chain still will not rotate, you should take the saw to your nearest authorized dealer for the necessary repairs. Now that you have cleaned your saw, reinstalled the bar and chain, and made the proper adjustments, it's time to sharpen your chain. A handy tool for sharpening the chain in the field is this stump vise that will hold the saw firmly while sharpening. If you are sharpening your chain in a workshop or garage, a bench vise will work just as handily. Other items you will need to properly sharpen your chain are a file and guide with the proper size round file, a flat file, and a depth gauge tool. Check your owner's manual or ask your authorized dealer for the proper file size and depth gauge tool required for your saw's chain. This information can also be found in the chain leaflet packed with new loops of steel chain. Before we sharpen the chain, it will help you understand the process better if you know the different components that make up your chain. These are the cutters. Your chain has separate left and right hand cutters. They are the parts you will be sharpening. Located on the front of each of the cutters is a protrusion called the depth gauge, or as some people like to refer to as the raker or drag. The depth gauge acts much like the adjustment on a hand plane chisel and determines the depth of the cut or chip that the tooth will take. The wider the gap between the tooth's cutting edge and the top of the depth gauge, the larger the chip the chain will take. If there were no gap between the cutting edge and the depth gauge, the chain virtually wouldn't cut at all. Your chain has been designed to cut optimally with a specific depth gauge clearance. Check your owner's manual or with your authorized dealer to see what gap is specified for your chain. You can see that the cutter's top plate has a declining slope. As the tooth's cutting edges sharpen back, the depth gauge will also need to be filed to maintain the recommended chip clearance between the tops of the depth gauge and the tooth's cutting edge. The chain consists of a series of tie straps and rivets which hold the components together, separating the left and right hand cutters alternately. This is the drive link. It has several functions. It's the portion of the chain that engages the sprocket, propelling the chain around the guide bar. It acts as a scooping device, dispersing the lubricant that comes from the oiler to components of the bar and chain, and it guides the chain in the bar groove. For your chain to be sharpened properly, you must make sure that each tooth has been filed at the same specific angles with the proper file that the top plate of each cutter tooth is the same length and that the depth gauges are set at the proper height. Begin the process by looking for the cutter with the most damage or wear. This will become your master cutter. Once sharpened properly, this cutter's shape and length will be what all the other cutters should look like. Not doing so will result in poor cutting performance. Your chain will run roughly and could even break. As you file the first cutter, Count the number of filing strokes that you take, and be conscious of the amount of pressure you're applying to the file. Using the same number of strokes, with the same amount of pressure on the rest of your cutters, should result in a consistent length on each. If you're uncertain, check the individual cutter's lengths with a measuring device. If you find that some teeth are longer than others, make the necessary sharpening adjustments. 
always file the cutter from the inner portion of the cutter outward. Never file from the outside in. This will dull the chain and damage the file. And when you're filing, never allow the file to drag back across the cutting edge when pulling the file back. Doing so will quickly dull your cutter and damage your file as well. Your file and guide has a plate positioned on both sides of the file. Placing the file and guide on the chain, the plate on one side of the file will rest on the leading edge of the cutter, while the other plate will rest on the top portion of the depth gauge. Equipped with the proper size round file, and assuming that your depth gauges have been maintained in the past, this will give your round file the proper filing depth when sharpening, resulting in the proper edge on the cutter. Also, when filing, the file and guide should be held at a 90 degree angle to the bar, or level. Tilting the file and guide even slightly can result in a misfiled chain that won't function properly. On the top of your file and guide, you will see lines scribed into the metal. These lines, kept parallel to the guide bar when sharpening each tooth, will result in the proper angle required for the tooth's cutting edge. When used properly, your file and guide will help assure a proper and consistent cutting angle and filing depth on each tooth. This is how a properly sharpened cutter should look. Here is a cutter that has been improperly filed and has a severe back slope, a sign possibly indicating that too large a file was used. This chain has a severe hook indicating that too small a round file was used or that the file was pushed down too hard and allowed to drop too far down into the tooth during the filing process. Here you see a top plate with too shallow of an angle and this is a top plate with too severe an angle. Now that you have the proper file and guide and you have determined your starting point, begin your filing. Remember to count your strokes, the amount of pressure you're applying to the file, and do not drag your file back across the cutter. The right and left hand cutters alternate, so you will need to file every other tooth from one side of the bar, or all of the right hand cutters first, for instance. Then change to the other side to sharpen all of the left hand cutters, again remembering to keep the angles and depth the same on all teeth. Once all of your cutters have been sharpened, on both sides, you'll need to check the depth gauge height and file down the tang if needed. Place the depth gauge tool on the chain as shown here, allowing the tooth's depth gauge to protrude in the slot of the tool. If any portion of the depth gauge protrudes above the slot in the tool, that portion will need to be filed down level with the depth gauge tool using your flat file. Perform this same procedure for every tooth. If the depth gauges are not maintained and are too high, not allowing enough clearance, this will result in poor performance and reduce the chain's ability to cut. If you don't use the proper depth gauge tool and file the depth gauges too low, below the manufacturer's specifications, this will result in a chain that cuts too aggressively, possibly causing harm to your saw and increasing the risk of kickback, making the chainsaw very unsafe, which can result in serious or even fatal injury to the operator. If you have filed your chain's depth gauges several times, you may find the leading edge of the depth gauge will need to be dressed to conform to an angle similar to how it looked when it was new. Steel depth gauges have a line scribed into the metal showing the proper angle for the leading edge for you to follow. If you don't maintain this angle, it can result in excessive vibration when cutting, as well as diluting the low kickback properties on some chains. For some people, sharpening a chain is very uncomfortable or even intimidating. If this is the case with you, you may want to keep one or more spare chains that are sharpened properly with you while you are working with your chainsaw. As your chain becomes dull, you can easily replace the dull chain with one of the sharpened spares. When you're done with your work, return your dull chains to your authorized dealer where they can be properly sharpened on a specially designed electric chain grinder. And you will be ready to cut again with a set of freshly sharpened chains. Next, check your chain brake to make sure it is functioning properly and that it engages and disengages. Like an automobile brake, your chainsaw's chain brake will incur wear each time it is engaged. The amount of wear will vary depending on things such as usage or even the conditions in which the saw is used. Excessive wear will reduce the effectiveness of the chain brake and can ultimately render it inoperable. Beyond your own inspection, you should always return your steel chainsaw to your authorized dealer to have the chain brake inspected according to the schedule found in your steel owner's manual. With the engine running at idle, engage the chain brake by moving your left wrist forward while gripping the handle. Then accelerate the engine to full throttle for no more than about 3 seconds to avoid premature wear to the braking system or harm to the engine. 
The chain must not rotate. If the chain brake fails to function properly, it is imperative that you take your chainsaw to an authorized dealer for the proper repairs prior to using the chainsaw again. We've performed all of the basic inspection and maintenance on your chainsaw. It's almost time to cut wood, but before we do, let's take a look at protective apparel that is available today, critical to reducing the risk of serious or fatal injury while operating a chainsaw. Remember, a chainsaw is a very powerful tool, and if not handled properly, it can be a dangerous or even deadly tool. Protective apparel has been designed to help reduce injuries when using your chainsaw. Just like helmets and pads can help reduce injuries to your children when playing today's sports. You invest in their protection. It's just as important, and you owe it to yourself, your family, and your friends to take the necessary precautions to reduce your risks. Invest in the proper protective apparel and reduce the chances of exposing yourself to serious injury or even death when working with your chainsaw. Some of the major components of protective apparel today are heavy work boots, preferably with steel toes and cut retardant material, specially designed Angtex chaps or leggings designed to quickly stop a chain should the chain have accidental contact with you, the most common cause for injuries when using a chainsaw. Protective shirts are also available with this same Angtex material, as well as gloves, a helmet system with ANSI-rated hearing protection and face shield, and ANSI-rated protective eyewear. Our operator shown here has on his proper protective apparel, and like our operator, Steel strongly advises that you always wear heavy denim work trousers that fit snugly and do not drag on the ground. His shirt is tucked in and not hanging loosely. All precautions that you should take when dressing for work when using your chainsaw. Plus, if you have long or braided hair, it's recommended that you either pin your hair up or securely tuck it into your shirt or helmet system. Okay, it's time to get to work. Your cutting experience should consist of several steps. First, make sure you have all the equipment you'll need. Your chainsaw, fuel oil mix, bar and chain oil, items needed to maintain your saw, an axe, wedges, water, a first aid kit, cell phone, and very important, a partner. It's recommended that you always have a partner with you and not work alone to help share the workload as well as to watch out for each other and be available in the case of an emergency. One very important rule, never operate your chainsaw if you're not in good physical condition and mental health, fatigued, or under the influence of any substance which might impair vision, dexterity, or judgment. If you have any condition that might be aggravated by strenuous work, check with your doctor before operating a chainsaw. The first task is to prepare your chainsaw for use. Begin by giving it one more inspection, looking for loose, missing, or broken parts, a chain that is sharpened and adjusted properly, and a chain brake that operates properly. Fueling your chainsaw should be done on a clear and level surface, and always fuel your chainsaw in an area that will be a minimum of 10 feet from where you'll be starting the saw to avoid the chance of lingering fuel vapors from igniting. Wipe away any debris from around the fuel cap and release the cap slowly. Pressure can build up in your fuel tank, and by slowly removing the cap, you will allow this excess pressure that may exist to release gradually. Fill the tank with the proper fuel oil mix and reinstall the fuel cap. Wipe away any excess fuel that may be spilled on the chainsaw or the surface where your chainsaw is sitting. If you happen to get any fuel on your clothing, change them immediately before using your chainsaw. Every time you add fuel to your chainsaw, you must also add bar and chain lubricant to the oil reservoir. Again, clean the area around the filler cap with a rag and remove the cap. Once full, replace the cap and wipe away any oil which may have spilled. Next, inspect the area where you will actually be working. Determine what you will be cutting whether it's a standing tree or a tree already lying on the ground, and then plan your work. Regardless whether you are felling a tree or working around downed trees, you must first look for obstacles that will help you determine the proper steps to take. If power lines are in the vicinity and near the wood you'll be working on, it's recommended that you have a professional with the proper tools and experience do the work for you. The same holds true if you'll be working near buildings, structures, or other types of personal property, such as vehicles or fences. 
Look for limbs and snags that may be located in the tops of trees in the area you're working in, referred to as widowmakers by professional loggers. Cutting wood with a chainsaw produces vibrations in the wood that can be just enough vibration to release a snagged limb. Disregarding this precaution and being struck by falling limbs has injured many chainsaw operators, both seriously and fatally. Also, be keenly aware of the weather. If the weather is rainy or windy conditions exist, it is advised that you postpone your work to another time. Wood becomes very slippery when wet, which can cause you to lose your footing, possibly resulting in serious injury. And wind can make it very difficult to manage the wood you are cutting, particularly when felling a tree. Other than the people who are there to assist you with your work, your partner never allow anyone else or pets to be in or near the work area. The people working with you must always maintain a safe distance from the chainsaw and the work you are doing. Develop a set of hand signals or other gestures to communicate with each other at a safe distance from the work area. Clear the area where you will be working to allow solid footing and safe movement. Evaluate the conditions of the wood you'll be cutting and the surrounding area and make a plan on how you will proceed with the work in the safest possible manner. Starting your chainsaw must be done in the proper fashion to help avoid the dangers that can occur in the starting process. Never start your saw by drop starting it or throw starting it. There are two methods that are acceptable for starting your saw. One by starting the saw on the ground and the other by starting your saw in a standing position. To start your saw on the ground, use the following procedure. First, find a firm, flat area, free from any obstacles where you can maintain good balance and footing. And remember, it cannot be any closer than 10 feet from where you fueled your chainsaw. Always make certain there are no bystanders in the immediate area. Engage the chain brake and place the master control lever in the full choke or cold start position. If your chainsaw comes with a decompression valve, depress it at this time. Insert your right foot through the opening of the rear handle. With the bottom of your foot firmly placed against the wide flat portion of the handle standing on the left side of the saw, place your left hand on the top of the forward handle, firmly grasping the handle with your fingers and thumb fully wrapped around the handle, your arm fully extended and elbow locked. Grasp the starter handle with your right hand and pull up on the rope slowly until you feel resistance. At this point, give the starter a sharp pull. At the end of this pull, slowly guide the starter rope back into the starter housing. Never release the handle and allow the rope and grip to snap back into the housing. Doing so could cause damage to the saw or injury to yourself. Continue pulling on the starter until the saw tries to start. Some people refer to the noise the saw will make as a burp. Once this has happened, it is critical that you don't pull the rope again until you have moved the control lever off choke and to the warm-up position. If you fail to do so and give the rope just one more pull with the choke on, you can flood the saw and it won't start without performing minor service. If your saw does flood, check your owner's manual for the procedure recommended to get your saw started. The saw has burped and you have placed the control lever to the warm-up position. Continue pulling on the rope. Usually only a few pulls are required at this time and the saw should begin to run. Pick the saw up and hold it in a safe manner with both hands. Then release the chain brake and accelerate the chainsaw. Accelerate the saw a few times to warm it up until the saw accelerates without hesitation. Your chainsaw is now ready to use. The proper way to turn off your chainsaw is to first engage the chain brake by rolling your left wrist forward. Then slide the control lever to the off position with the thumb of your right hand, never letting loose of the saw. Once your chainsaw has been warmed up and you've shut it off, it shouldn't be necessary to choke it to restart if you are restarting relatively soon after having stopped the saw. Use the same procedures as we just discussed, but start the process with the control lever in the warm-up position rather than the choke position. The second method for starting your chainsaw is in the standing position. This can come in handy if you're in an area that doesn't have a great deal of flat, unobstructed surface for ground starting the chainsaw. The process of engaging the chain brake and operating the controls will be exactly the same as ground starting. The only difference will be the way that you hold the chainsaw in the process. Again, make sure that your area is clear, you have solid footing, and there are no bystanders nearby. With the chain brake engaged and the controls in the proper position, grasp the forward handle with your left hand, thumb and fingers wrapped around the handle. 
Place the rear handle between your legs with the upper portion of the rear handle braced against your right inner thigh. With your left arm extended and locked, pull briskly on the starter handle with your right hand in the same manner we discussed in ground starting. Once you've started the saw, grasp the rear handle with your right hand and begin the warm-up process. There are some basic rules that you should always follow when using your chainsaw. When moving about with your chainsaw, the engine should always be turned off and the chain brake engaged. The bar should be positioned behind you and the muffler pointed away from your body. If you have a scabbard for your bar, it's recommended that you have it installed when transporting your saw. Never walk with the bar positioned in front of you. Even with the engine off and the chain brake engaged, if you were to fall and come into contact with the chain, you could easily cut yourself on the chain. As you're working with your chainsaw, always hold the saw firmly with both hands. Never, under any circumstance, operate your chainsaw with one hand. Doing so will enhance the chances that you could become seriously or even fatally injured while using the chainsaw. Regardless of whether or not you're a right-handed person, you must always grip the front handle with your left hand. Make sure that your fingers and thumb are wrapped around the handlebar. Do not operate your saw with the thumb not fully engaging the handlebar. Your right hand will grip the rear handle and also operate the throttle trigger, throttle interlock, and the chainsaw controls. When operating your steel chainsaw, the master control lever can easily be accessed by the thumb of your right hand while still maintaining a firm grip on the rear handle with your fingers. Always be aware of your working conditions and how they can contribute to three of the most common and potentially dangerous reactive forces. Kickback, pushback, and pull-in. Kickback occurs when the moving saw chain near the upper quadrant of the bar nose contacts a solid object or is pinched, or is incorrectly used to begin a plunge or boring cut. The greater the force of the kickback reaction, the more difficult it becomes for the operator to control the saw. The type of bar and saw chain you use is an important factor in the occurrence and force of kickback reaction. Steel recommends the use of their reduced kickback bars and low kickback chain color-coded green. Check with your authorized dealer for more details on which bars and chains are available for your chainsaw. Your chain brake is another feature that can help reduce the risk of serious or fatal injury from kickback reactions. Although the chain brake does not stop kickback from occurring and it is not a fail-safe system, it can stop the chain quickly when activated, reducing the chances of a rotating chain coming into contact with the operator. Study carefully these 12 points that can help you avoid kickback. Hold the chainsaw firmly with both hands and maintain a secure grip at all times. Be aware of the location of the guide bar nose at all times. Never let the nose of the guide bar contact any object. Do not cut limbs with the nose of the guide bar. Be especially careful when cutting small, tough limbs, small size brush and saplings, which may easily catch the chain. Don't overreach. Don't cut above shoulder height. Begin cutting and continue cutting at full throttle. Cut only one log at a time. Use extreme caution when entering a previous cut. Do not attempt to plunge cut if you are not experienced with these cutting techniques. Be alert for shifting of the log or other forces that may cause the cut to close and pinch the chain. Maintain saw chain properly. Cut with a correctly sharpened, properly tensioned chain at all times. Stand to the side of the plane of the bar and chain when cutting. Pull-in occurs when the chain on the bottom of the bar is suddenly stopped. This can happen if the chain becomes pinched, caught, or if it encounters a foreign object in the wood. The reaction of the chain pulls the saw forward and may cause the operator to lose control. To avoid pull-in, always start a cut with the chain rotating at full speed and the bumper spike in contact with the wood. Sometimes pull-in can be prevented by using wedges to open the kerf or cut, particularly when making a bucking cut. Pushback occurs when the chain on the top of the bar is suddenly stopped when it's pinched, caught, or encounters a foreign object in the wood. The reaction of the chain drives the saw straight back towards the operator and may cause loss of control of the saw. To avoid pushback, always be alert to forces or situations that may cause material to pinch the top of the chain. Never cut more than one log at a time. And don't twist the saw when withdrawing the bar from a plunge cut or underbuck cut. The chain can easily pinch in this situation. When cutting wood, 
always make sure you have firm, solid footing and keep your back straight using your legs and knees to adjust your height. Always operate the chainsaw with the bar and chain positioned to the right of your body, never in line with your body. This will greatly decrease the chances of serious or fatal injury in the event your chainsaw experiences a reactive force event or kickback. If you're moving between cuts, always engage your chain brake prior to movement and don't release the chain brake until you're ready to begin your next cut. This will also decrease the chances of serious injury if the saw were to become entangled in limbs or shrubbery or if you were to accidentally drop or lose control of the saw. If you need to clear away brush or limbs as you're working, always engage the chain brake first. If you have a significant amount of brush or limbs to move or heavy objects, it is recommended that you engage your chain brake and shut the saw off before clearing those objects. If you're starting the chainsaw in the immediate work area, regardless of the method you use, ground starting or standing starts, make sure you have a clear, unobstructed area to do so. Never try and start the saw in a confined area or in an area with projecting limbs or brush that can come into contact with the bar and chain. If you've become fatigued or out of breath, engage the chain brake, turn off the chainsaw and take a break. And always drink lots of fluids. Do not operate your chainsaw without the proper protective apparel and clothing. If you have a partner with you, always make sure that they keep a safe distance from the area you're working in and never allow them to hold or brace any wood that you are cutting. Never allow two or more chainsaws to be used at the same time in the same work area. Two people cutting on or near the same piece of wood can change the balance of the wood or release limbs that can cause one or both operators to become injured without warning. Never operate your chainsaw above shoulder height and never use a ladder or any other object to stand on to increase your reach. Doing so will increase your susceptibility to dangerous reactive force situations as well as the chances that you could lose your footing and fall, possibly landing on a running chainsaw with the chain turning, a very serious or even fatal situation. If you have limbs to cut that are above shoulder height, Steel makes specially designed saws with extended reach to perform those operations, like the one shown here. It is recommended that you use one of these products for this work, or turn the job over to a professional that has the proper training and equipment to finish the job. No matter what the job, whether it's a tree lying on the ground, partially suspended above the ground, or a standing tree, you must always evaluate the job and the dynamics of the situation before you begin cutting. As you are in the process of cutting wood, the dynamics of the tree, the weight and balance will change. For example, here we have a tree ready to be limbed and then bucked into firewood length. With the larger and heavier limbs, there could be a chance that the tree will shift its position as the weight of those limbs are taken away. Make sure that you evaluate this prior to beginning your cutting and that you position yourself and plan your work accordingly. There are some basic rules to follow when limbing a tree on the ground. First, always begin limbing from the base of the tree, moving your way upward. Whenever possible, keep the log between you and the limb you're cutting. Make sure that you have good solid footing at all times. Never stand on the log and never hold the saw with one hand while cutting. Always hold the saw with both hands, a firm grip, fingers and thumbs fully engaged around the handles. If the log is located on a slope, Always stand on the uphill side of the log, so if it rolls, it rolls away from you. If the log is supported by limbs on the underside of the tree, leave these limbs for last as they will help support the tree during your work. Be cautious when cutting a limb from the bottom or under bucking. The limb may tend to close in the cut, resulting in a pinched chain and guide bar. If this happens, turn off the saw and remove the saw from the cut. This is a limb that is under pressure, referred to as a spring pole. These can be very dangerous as they can spring back towards you with a great amount of force when cut. This can cause you to lose control of the chainsaw or result in severe or fatal injury. Be very cautious when cutting spring poles. Release the tension by making multiple shallow cuts on the outside of the arc with you standing at the center of the arc. Now that the limbs have been removed and the area around the log is cleared, you can begin bucking the log into the desired lengths. 
If your log is still suspended by lower branches, your job may be easier if you begin bucking from the top of the tree, as long as you're not cutting above shoulder height or have to reach. Then begin working down toward the butt. With the tree suspended off the ground, usually the sections you cut will drop effortlessly to the ground. Notice how our chainsaw operator is using his spikes to steady the saw while he is cutting. It's also a good idea to position your body away from the uncut portion of the log. This will create a clear zone for you to move in the event the log were to shift or move. You can work like this up to the point where the tree is suspended by a lower limb. At this point, you'll need to cut the lower limb and let the tree settle to the ground. Be very cautious when doing this and predetermine which way the log will drop or roll when the bottom limbs are removed. You'll want to position yourself on the opposite side of the log's movement and be cautious of your bar pinching in the cut as these limbs will usually be under a considerable amount of pressure. If you are bucking a log that is laying on the ground, there are a few things you'll need to know to perform this work properly. First, remember that if you touch the ground with a moving saw chain, even if it's for a split second, this will be enough to dull your chain. Since the wood is laying on the ground, you will need to be cautious of this. Here, you see our operator making a series of cuts in the log, not quite cutting completely through in order not to hit the ground with his chain. Once he has completed this series of cuts, he will roll the log over 180 degrees and finish the cut. This technique is a good one to use when the log is laying flat on even ground. But oftentimes, the ground the log is laying on is not flat and requires a variety of cuts to properly buck the log. This log is suspended with the weight focused in the middle of the log where you want to make your cut. As you cut this log, the log will begin to drop in the middle and your cut will begin to close up. If you don't immediately remove your bar from the cut, it will be pinched. To avoid this, first make a relief cut on the top side of the log. Then begin an underbucking cut from the bottom in such a manner that the two cuts will intersect. Done properly, you will be able to buck the log without pinching your guide bar but this takes a lot of practice and skill and is usually best left for a professional chainsaw operator. This log is suspended, but the weight of the tree is on the ends of the log. This means if you were to buck this log, the log will tend to move upwards when cut. If this is the case, you'll do just the opposite that you did on the previous log by making your relief cut on the bottom and the finishing cut from the top. On either method, you can also use your plastic wedges to help keep the logs from closing in the final cuts. This is typical storm damage, where several damaged trees are intertwined in various positions. This work should be done by professionals only. The amount of risk and unsafe conditions that exist in multiple trees being blown down and the skill needed to work on these trees is tremendous. If you must work on storm damaged trees, Always drag the trees into the clear with a heavy vehicle such as a tractor or bulldozer before cutting them. Here is some damage around wires. Again, this work must be left up to professionals with the right equipment and training. When felling a tree, you will need to evaluate the dynamics of the tree. But there are also several other important details that must be considered before you choose your trees to fell. First, look in a 360-degree radius for any hazards or property that could be struck by the tree you're falling. If any of these are within reach of the tree, regardless of the direction in which you think the tree will fall, it is highly advised that you call in a professional with the proper training and equipment to fell the tree. Check the weather conditions. If it is a windy day, the top of the tree acts just like a sail and can adversely affect the way the tree will fall in relation to the way you want it to fall. If this is the case, it is advisable that you fell the tree when conditions are more favorable or call in a professional to finish the job. Look for other trees and shrubbery in the immediate area and how they will be affected when your tree falls. Also, look for snags or loose hanging branches in the tree and surrounding trees. The vibrations and harmonics in the tree created by the cutting action of the chainsaw or the forces caused by windy conditions can be just enough to dislodge the branches where they can fall straight down onto the saw operator, a dangerous hazard that can result in serious injury or even death. Now that you've chosen the tree you will fell and the surrounding area is suitable for the job, let's look at the fundamentals for felling the tree you must first determine the direction the tree will fall. 
To do so, take into account these basics. The lean of the tree, which may indicate the direction the tree will most easily fall. Also, look at the branches of the tree and determine if there are a greater proportion of limbs or heavier limbs on one side of the tree than the other. The displacement of weight by the limbs can also have a factor on the direction the tree would most naturally fall, even if a slight lean to a tree is in the opposite direction. This is a critical choice that you have to make, and if you are uncertain at all, it is highly advised that you either move to another tree to fall or that you call in a professional to complete the work. You will also want to take into account other trees or shrubbery in the area that could affect the tree's fall or that could be damaged by the tree's fall. Once you've determined the direction that you will fall the tree, clear the area around the base of the tree so you have an unobstructed zone to work in. You'll also need to determine paths of retreat for yourself once the tree begins to fall or in case of an emergency. The paths of retreat should be at a 45 degree angle on both sides of the tree opposite the felling direction. Make certain that the entire paths of retreat are clear and unobstructed. Anyone working with you in the area should remain at a distance no closer than two and one half times the length of the tree to be fallen. And remember, never let bystanders or pets in or around the area you're working in. Your partner can be a great help in this regard to make sure no one enters into the work zone. To fell a tree properly, you should also have a set of plastic felling wedges and an axe similar to these. The wedges should be made of a plastic component as not to harm the cutters of the moving chain when used to wedge the tree. Steel or metal wedges can quickly dull a chain and cause a very dangerous condition in the felling process. Your axe will be used to dislodge any loose bark in the area of your cut, as well as the tool you will use to force the wedges into the felling cut. There are two popular felling techniques most commonly used today, the standard or common notch and the open face technique. Your owner's manual will describe various techniques for making felling cuts. In this video, we will show you the basic techniques using a bar that is suitable for the size of tree we are falling. If the tree you will be falling is larger in diameter than the usable bar length of your chainsaw, you will need to utilize special techniques to safely fell the tree. In this case, if you're not a trained professional, it is highly advised that you leave these larger trees to a professional with the right equipment and training. Let's begin by looking at how the standard or common notch technique works. The notch that you cut in the tree will consist of one cut that is horizontal, level with the ground, and a second cut that is at a 45 degree angle. These two cuts will intersect with each other, creating the felling notch. The side of the tree that you create the notch in will be the same side that you want the tree to fall. Here you can use your felling sights to help you properly position the notch and the hinge that will help control the felling of the tree. Pointing your felling sight at the location you want the tree to fall will give you the 90 degree angle that you will want for a properly placed notch. As you cut, always watch for weakness or rot in the tree. If the tree is weak or rotted, it is advisable that you have a trained professional remove the tree. Make your 45 degree cut first with a depth into the tree approximately one-fifth to one-quarter of the tree trunk's diameter. Next, make your horizontal cut, intersecting with the 45 degree cut, creating a wedge that can be removed from the tree. It is extremely important that these two cuts meet exactly, so take your time making certain that you get it right. You'll now move to the rear of the tree and begin the felling cut. If there's any loose bark on the back side of the tree, use your axe to dislodge the bark around the area that you will be making your felling cut. This cut will be horizontal and should be one to two inches higher than the horizontal cut of the felling notch made earlier. Always stay to the side of the tree when making your felling cut. Never work from directly behind the tree, as the tree could split and come backwards with deadly force, an event called barber chairing. As you begin to make the felling cut, add your plastic wedges to the back of the cut. These will keep the tree from settling back in the cut and pinching your guide bar, and they will also be instrumental in felling the tree, particularly if there is insignificant lean in the tree towards the desired felling direction. The hinge you create when done properly will leave approximately one-tenth the diameter of the tree uncut. Never cut into the hinge. Doing so could cause you to lose control of the direction of the fall. Once you have correctly made your hinge with the felling cut, and if the tree has sufficient lean, it will begin its fall to the ground. When you see the tree begin to fall, immediately remove the saw from the cut, turn it off with the chain brake engaged, and withdraw from the cutting area using one of your pre-planned escape routes. 
never remain near the tree during its fall. If you have finished making your back cut but the tree is not falling, you will use your wedges to complete the task. One hit at a time, drive the wedges further into the felling cut, waiting a few moments for the tree to absorb the dynamics of the wedging process. Continue the process until you see the tree begin to make its fall. Again, retreat to a safe distance while the tree falls. If for any reason the tree still won't fall after properly wedging it, do not attempt to make additional cuts with your chainsaw. This could result in serious or fatal injury. Bring the tree down with a cable winch, block and tackle, or heavy equipment such as a tractor or bulldozer. The second type of felling cut is the open face cut used by many of today's professionals. Unlike the standard or common technique, the open face uses an angled bottom cut that allows the tree to utilize the hinge throughout the fall all the way to the ground, giving you more control of the felling process. Again, you'll use the felling sights to direct the tree's fall in the desired direction. Make your first cut down at approximately a 50 degree angle to a depth of approximately one-fifth to one-quarter of the trunk diameter. Make the second cut from below at approximately a 40 degree angle. These cuts must match exactly and will result in a 90 degree wedge removed from the tree. When you make your back cut or felling cut, it should be horizontal and one to two inches above the apex of the open face cut or above where the two cuts on the open face meet, creating the proper hinge. Again, using your wedges just as you did with the standard or common technique to fall the tree. You have now gone through the basics of how to maintain and operate your chainsaw in a safe manner. But there is still one thing left to cover, and that's how to store your chainsaw when your work is done. Once you've finished your work, you should always loosen your chain. A chain can tighten as it cools down, possibly causing serious damage to the crankshaft and bearings when stored. It's also a good idea to coat your bar and chain with a corrosion-inhibiting oil if it will be sitting unused for any length of time. If you'll be storing your saw for a period of three months or longer before you intend to use it again, you should drain the fuel tank and run the engine until the carburetor is dry, or when the saw quits running. This will help prevent the parts in your carburetor from sticking or becoming inoperable. And always store your chainsaw in a dry, high, or locked location outside the reach of children or any other unauthorized person. We hope that this program will help make your chainsaw cutting experience a safer and more enjoyable one. For further information about your steel chainsaw, see your authorized steel dealer. For more information on steel, please see our website at steelusa.com or phone us at 1-800-GO-STEEL.